and a very hearty welcome to this uh, event. Uh, IIB had the privilege of uh, hosting Professor Vijendra Tripathi a few years ago. Uh, we actually hosted him and requested him to lead a roundtable discussion on reviving the subject of business history in management schools. As you all probably know very well that Professor Tripathi was a doyen in that field and he had established the business history as a very legitimate discipline at IIM Ahmedabad. And he is arguably one of the most prolific contributors on the subject of business history in India. But uh, post his retirement, the tradition was waning a little bit and then we had this temptation to kickstart or revive the tradition. And as a logical first step, we invited Professor Tripathi to come and lead a round table of uh, scholars who were engaged in business history to put their brains together and then figure out what needs to be done to revive this discipline of business history. And we published this as a paper in our IMB management review about, uh, you know, I think it was 2010 we published this. And he had some very, very interesting ideas to share in terms of how business schools can revive this interest in business history. Without going into the details, I can say that uh, we have been fortunate enough to follow at least some of the suggestions which he had done at that time. Uh, the first of it was we focused on the doctoral studies, so we have at least a couple of uh, uh, theses of doctoral students which came out from this place subsequent to that, which focused on some aspects of uh, business history. And then subsequently, we also have uh, added to our uh, faculty a couple of faculty members whose uh, interest is deep in business history, but they're also affiliated to disciplines which you might call as the mainstream disciplines in management school. I'm referring to my colleague uh, Deepak Mulgan, who works on public policy as a faculty in public policy, but then his deep interest is in history. And similarly, now we have uh, Pratik, who is actually affiliated to the, the group of strategy, corporate strategy and policy, but then he also has a deep interest and grounding in business history. So we have been somehow uh, managing to do take small steps in moving towards this, uh, 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 moving towards a more intense engagement with business history. And unfortunately, as you all know, we lost Professor Tripathi last month. And we thought it would be befitting for us to organize this seminar as a Professor Dhrivendra Tripathi Memorial Lecture, a series of three lectures to be offered by Professor Pratik Raj on some aspects of evolution of business and markets, which is an outcome of his uh, deep research into these areas. So I'm very happy that all of you could find time to be here today, and I extend once again a very hearty welcome to all of you, and also welcome for the remaining two lectures in this series. And without much ado, I'll hand it over to Pratik to continue. Thank you, Thank you Professor Kumar. Uh, so, so first of all, thank you all for coming uh, today uh, for this uh, event uh, organized by NSR Cell. Our primary goal is to promote uh, business and economic history following the legacy of Professor Tripathi and you guys form uh, kind of the nucleus of the community that we wish to build. Uh, Professor Tripathi was uh, someone uh, who was a mentor to many people here at IIM Bangalore and many PhD students of uh, IIM Bangalore today are doing economic history, uh, business history, like uh, Chinmay Tumbe at IIM Ahmedabad or Amol Agarwal at Ahmedabad University. Um, so when I started to uh, work on these lectures, I um, was reading uh, old works of Professor Tripathi and uh, it struck me that uh, Professor Tripathi made a very uh, seminal contribution to our understanding of business and economic history, which we often do not really uh, fully appreciate because we take it for granted. So for a long time, immediately after independence, uh, when we thought about Indian entrepreneurship, it was heavily stereotyped. And we used to talk about the fatalist Indian mind, which was fatalist because um, of the culture or the religion. And, which, and this, this mindset of fatalism was not the best suited for progress. Um, this was the kind of ideas uh, promoted by sociologist Max Weber. Um, now, it is in this kind of environment that uh, uh, Professor Tripathi comes in and he uh, challenges this cultural and religious view of, um, of history and uh, focuses on the material uh, interpretation that we should focus on uh, 
we should first focus on the material explanations and the material environment and try to see how that can influence people's behaviors. So, um, and then the Clio metric revolution happened in the United States. The Clio metric revolution was a revolution in economic history where people started to use basic economic concepts to explain a lot of uh, the historical processes. And with that revolution in place, now, we take it almost for granted that the first thing we have to look at when we look at history is the material condition, not the cultural mindset or uh, religious uh, philosophies and so forth. Those can be important, uh, but uh, they are something that comes secondary. First, we want to focus on the material conditions. So, uh, with that in mind, I wanted to uh, talk about how we have organized these seminars. Uh, the first one, today we are going to talk about evolution of business. So, how have businesses evolved over time? Then we are going to talk about evolution of markets, which are fundamentally linked to business, but they are different uh, because markets are, modern markets especially, are unique. Uh, the third is we are going to talk about um, the forces that drive this evolution. So, what are the uh, forces that push towards uh, modernization of markets, modernization of businesses, and so forth. So these are three themes that we're going to focus on. Um, and today what we're going to talk about, so we're going to first focus on these three modes of exchange, um, the three different fundamental ways in which we can do business, uh, and, or any sort of exchange with somebody. Then we're going to focus on um, looking at these three modes of exchange. We're going to look at the importance of embeddedness in business, and how traditionally Businesses were embedded in networks and hierarchies. We're going to talk about that, and then we're going to do some sort of an accounting measure of the good, the bad, and ugly of this embeddedness uh, that we see. And then we're going to look at some historical um, structures of uh, doing business, so uh, merchant guilds, uh, the taxi system, and we're going to talk about that. And then we're going to talk about how um, traditional businesses became less important, less uh, uh, dominant, and there was a rise of the modern business. And we're going to focus on Northwestern Europe, which was a very important uh, region for the rise of, uh, of modern business. And then we're going to talk about Indian businesses. So that's how today's talk is going to look like. So let's uh, jump into, um, into the, the talk. So, so you can, when, we, when you try to do any sort of a economic exchange with another person, uh, there are three fundamental modes in which you can try to conceptualize this relationship. The first is that you are in a sort of a, these pers this person is your friend. Uh, somebody you know, uh, your this person's reputation can be known, etc., etc. Second relationship is that this person is your boss. So this is a power relationship. Uh, it doesn't need to be repeated. Uh, it just that there's a p way through which this person can exert power. The third is a contractual way of doing business. So I uh, need something. I ask someone uh, at arm's length to provide that service to me. And that person provides me that service at a particular quality level and a particular price. So let's look at these three different modes of doing business. And it's important to understand these three to understand uh, the evolution of business over time. So relational businesses are essentially businesses where you uh, do an exchange with someone and there is a the way you monitor this person's bad behavior is by cutting off their future stream of income so um, so for example uh, one way you can do that is that you are in a repeated exchange with someone now if you are in a repeated exchange with someone and you expect to get a repeat business with someone you are naturally inclined to just be nice to the person who is giving you this business because if in case you don't uh, are not nice to this person, this person is simply going to cut off uh, their um, the business with you and you're going to lose a lot of money. Uh, so this is how a business used to happen with in the legendary town of Genoa in Italy. So Italy, uh, northern Italy was a very prosperous region, especially in the medieval period. And Genoa was um, a famous legendary city, which was a city of merchants. It was as uh, capitalistic as you can imagine it to be. So it was kind of ahead of its time in many ways. And the way trade would happen in this city was uh, through these uh, repeated exchanges. So say you are a principal with a lot of capital and you want to do long-term voyages. 
and you yourself cannot travel. So you hire someone, an agent, to do business in place of you, and you give this person the capital. Now the problem is that you're going off to a voyage to um, North, North Africa or to, um, to, uh, to Turkey, and it's, you may just run away, right? You may just simply run away with all that capital. And the question is, how are you going to handle that? And it's a huge area of economic research. And uh, the way you do that is that you basically give a high wage to this person. So you say, well, I'm going to give you a high wage. And because I'm giving you this high wage, if in case you're not going to come back to me and you're going to take off all this money, you're going to lose all that future high wages that you're going to get. And keeping an accounting of this, um, this trade-off, the agent decides that, look, it makes a better sense to me to continue to be in this relationship and wait for the long payoff instead of uh, you know, the short-term temptation to run away with whatever capital I have. So that's one way through which you don't need any government, you don't need any hierarchy in place, and you can still manage a relationship. The other fundamentally different way in which you can organize a business in, within the framework of relationships is through reputation. So um, imagine that you are in a community. So academia is a great community with reputation. So it's a community which is dense. So it's a small community, people know each other. Now if in that uh, community, if you're someone who does not behave properly, well, you can risk uh, ruin, uh, getting your reputation ruined. And if in case that happens, uh, well, you may not get a job in the future. So here, the repetition with a particular agent is not really important. Uh, you may or may not may do a business just once with someone, but because reputation is something hanging over you in this very dense network, you are able to um, evaluate and behave properly because if you don't, uh, you are not going to get any business in this particular network. So um, the classical kind of way in which example of this business are Maghrib traders. So Maghrib traders, uh, Mag Jewish Maghrib traders were traders who were trading in um, Maghrib, which is a northern uh, it Africa and the Middle East region. And um, they used to be members of dense networks. At least that's how it's theorized. There's a bit of debate on this topic, whether the description of uh, Maghrib traders is 100% accurate. Uh, though for a simple conceptual understanding, uh, these are dense networks. And if in, you got uh, an agent from the, within this network and you gave business to this person, this person was not getting a very high wage, by the way, because there was no need of. Because just in any case, this person misbehaved. Um, the reputation of this person could be uh, damaged, and then this person would not get any business amongst the Maghrib principles. So these are two fundamental ways in which, without the need of a government, without the need of a boss, a hierarchy, or power, you can organize business. And two very uh, uh, important ways in which uh, businesses traditionally have done um, their activities. Uh, an important person in this uh, stream of research is Avner Greif, uh, who uh, in the late 1980s and 1990s wrote a string of papers trying to establish the basic economics of doing business um, in the medieval period. However, when we think about relationship, um, a sociologist or a political scientist will say that, look, power is everywhere and power predates all kind of transactions that we have. So the second form of doing business is, a, is of power exchange. So here you don't need to be in a repeated transaction with someone. Simply if in case you have some way to exert power on someone, you can get them to do things uh, as you wish to. So um, while we were talking about these legendary Genoese traders, um, not far away uh, in Europe itself, there were peasants who were uh, being oppressed in the feudal system. And while we think of feudal system in very sociological lens, but it's also a form of doing business, where you are getting a transaction of your grain produce and putting it, uh, taking it forward to uh, different levels of hierarchy. The difference in this kind of uh, structure is that um, not everyone has equal autonomy. You don't even have a choice to run away or so, because if you do so, you're, you are gonna get uh, punished. So there is a, there is a notion of power that comes in, into, into this picture. Now you can uh, think of this as an addition over uh, relational exchange because power relationships are also basically relationships. But um, 
even though you may not know this person for a long time, or if in case this person does not belong, this person's reputation does not matter, but as long as you can exert power, you can simply punish this person. And this is not just uh, an important uh, notion in, uh, in historical settings. Uh, there's a very profound idea in firm theory that, um, so uh, last to last year's Nobel laureate, uh, Oliver Hart, he wrote a seminal uh, paper in 1986 about uh, the, the reason why firms exist and the size they have is because you want to acquire resources and have power over them because it's much more, if two things are too complementary to each other, you just want it to be in-house rather than to be in a contractual or a, or a repeat, for it to be done by someone else. So you just want to own B. So if B is an asset that's very valuable, you just want to own that asset uh, completely. Uh, another example of this power-based exchange is the absolutist state in China, which has historically been, uh, been absolutist, and the, and the size of the state has larger been large. So it has the civil examination way back in like, like thousands of years ago, uh, and the state size has been pretty large in this period, and so that's another example of uh, of power exchange. Now the third type of exchange is the contractual exchange, which we um, find very intuitive. So if say you are a person who wants a service, you post an ad, and for that ad, uh, you get people uh, bidding for you, uh, providing you, uh, claiming to provide you a particular service at a particular price. You pick the service uh, and the cheapest price, and then uh, you write an agreement, and the business is done. However, in this entire gamut of activities, what we often ignore is that there is an invisible third party uh, and it's invisible because at times it doesn't even come into play and this third party is a state or a leviathan as Thomas Hobbes will call it. So essentially someone whom we have asked to organize the affairs for us. Now if in case this uh, leviathan or this state is fair and effective. So if there is a breach of contract, well, A, it is going to be fairly going to adjudicate, adjudicate between these two, uh, in the, the dis dispute. And it has the power, which is even more important, it has actually got the power to do something about the breach of contract. If this uh, exists, that's great. Uh, well, uh, this kind of contractual exchange can happen. But if in case you do not have the ability to um, enforce contracts, the state doesn't have any power, well, in that world, it becomes increasingly difficult um, to engage in this contractual exchange because, well, there's no third party who has the full weight of the contract. So um, we're going to talk about this in the second lecture. So the second lecture is precisely going to be all about this. And that's what my PhD thesis is about. So I'm today not going to talk about it. I'm going to focus largely on the other two. So in a world where state is not as effective in um, uh, establishing contracts, implementing contracts. In that kind of world, uh, people do not have this third mode of doing business. And they are largely stuck with these two, which is the network, uh, or the relational structure, and the power structure. And um, so this is the economic lens of looking at things, that there is a relational uh, contract, a relational way of doing things, and there's a power-based way of doing things. But when you move uh, from the lens of um, economics to the lens of organizational science or uh, sociology, you get into the world of embeddedness. Uh, so embeddedness is a profound idea uh, uh, promoted by, uh, first introduced by Karl Polanyi in uh, 1945 in his book, The Great Transformation. And then um, uh, Mark Granovetter is a major sociologist who wrote uh, some seminal works about embeddedness. And embeddedness is essentially a mirror idea to what I have discussed for the moment, that every, every economic exchange, even more so in traditional societies, was embedded in these uh, networks and hierarchies. So you can imagine the entire, uh, any, you take any organization and you can view it as a set of networks and a set of hierarchies. And um, what are these structures like? So, um, Think about China. So in China, there was a strong clan system. Even today, people do business through guanjis, which are basically these uh, resourceful relationships that people have. So um, 
that's a network. So people do business today in China through networks. And then there's obviously the state, which has an Im Im immense importance and significance in the Chinese state. When we think about Europe, we think about guilds. Merchant guilds were a way of organizing business where you used to have all these different the merchants used to form these associations and networks, and they would use to do these businesses in these guilds. And um, at the same time, you had the feudal manor, which would organize business in terms of a hierarchy. And people could be found embedded in both these two structures. But I think the best example of this embeddedness is the Indian caste system, because the Indian caste system provides you both these two different views at the same time. Because on one hand, um, Indian caste is essentially 2,000 or 5,000 different jatis, and these jatis can be viewed as networks. And actually, when you look at the history of, uh, of caste, you find that there used to be uh, jatis which had nothing to do with your birth. For example, there would be a jati of transgenders. So every census would have a, a, a jati of uh, hijras or transgenders. So that's not a birth-based uh, jati. It's just an association of sorts. Uh, a network, but at the same time, this entire um, jati system was in a viscous sort of uh, hierarchy, so or varna, where some people were frozen at the top and some people were frozen at the bottom, and in between there was some churn from time to time based on the local dynamics. So again, if a person born in India wanted to do business, they had to navigate through their jati and their varna and the various networks and embeddedness that they found themselves in. And the key question that one can think of, and basically what I was interested in during my PhD, was that why do these even persist in the first place? What's so powerful about these uh, networks and hierarchies that they persist and they just never go away? So I continue to, the, the, a caste identity continues to be important, not just in social relationships, but also even in economic relationships. Why does it have to be like that? And it goes down back to the importance of embeddedness or the importance of relational or power-based uh, structures. So uh, this is like a network where think of a person, A, who has a trusted network, and um, A can do business with people of this network, or A can do business with this person, B. This person, B, is out of this person's network. But the question is, should this person do this business with B? So if the person A did a business with B, uh, where uh, it was one shot, it would look more like a contractual exchange, while if in case the this person did business with its networks, it would either look like, uh, it would either do business with someone with whom they can repeat their business, or else they would do business with some, uh, you know, local, with the help of a local politician or a local um, hierarchical member of society to aid that business. Now, uh, in this world, even today, even if all the contractual exchange and all the uh, institutions are perfect, even in that world, it's not always necessary that we do business with strangers, simply because we don't know much about strangers. And because of that, uh, there, there arise two fundamental market frictions in any kind of market exchange. The first is the problem of information asymmetry. So say you want to get a loan for starting a business, now, um, you can go to a, uh, to a bank and ask for a loan. Well, the problem is that you know a lot about your business, but the bank does not. And because the bank does not know about your business, uh, it creates a problem. Ideally, if you could perfectly tell the business, uh, the bank, that this is how this business is, is uh, going to make money, well, you should get a loan. You don't have to be a rich person to be able to start a business, because if you have a good business plan, you should be able to attract a loan, and you should be able to get credit, and you should be able to start a business. But this does not happen because, well, there is information asymmetry in place. What information asymmetry does is that while I know a lot about my business, uh, the, uh, the banker does not. And that um, creates a problem. Uh, so you, the bank charges you a much higher interest rate, if you are poorer, if you belong to a lower caste, you're even more likely to be charged a higher interest rate because, well, people don't know enough about you or people doubt uh, your ability to pay the loan back. Now, say you have a very um, rich banker friend who, who knows about you, who <coughs> knows about your business, uh, who has known your history. That person, because can be in a position to better assess what you do, 
is able to um, grant you a loan because this person has more information about you and is able to give you a loan at a lower rate. So that's one example through which um, information uh, gets passed through networks, gets passed through people we know, and in general, they tend to be rich conduits of information. So um, in banking, local managers play a very important role of building relationships with managers, uh, with, with local customers, trying to know about their business, about their life, about uh, information, soft information about them. And um, getting this soft information makes them better at assessing a person's ability to pay the loan back. And embeddedness play a very, plays a very important role in that particular setting when you want to get rich information about someone, which you can't have about a stranger. The second problem, which we kind of talk, talked about already, is of moral hazard. So um, think about um, the, the, the trader, the principal and the agent, where the agent could just run away. And because uh, embeddedness provides a setting where you cannot just run away, you are in a network, you're in a hierarchy, it creates an opportunity for you to repeat exchange again and again and again. And that kind of keeps bad behavior under check through reputation or um, repetition. So these are two fundamental benefits that embeddedness provides, why you see it uh, you know, being so dominant in all parts of the world, not just uh, in India or China, which are developing, but also in the United States, for example, finance is heavily relationship-based. It's not a stranger-based uh, business. But while we talk about all these good things about embeddedness, there are some limits. First of all, um, there are limits to how much information you can get through your networks. So we learned this from our own exp experiences with the social media. So you have all your family and your friends on social media, and they all know each other as well. Now what it does is that while, when an information comes in, it goes to everyone, and then it gets recycled and recycled and recycled again. And when you belong to these cliques of um, networks, you don't have any diversity of information. You keep getting the same information again and again and again. And when diversity of information becomes important, um, the embeddedness structure kind of fails. So um, this, in uh, using the work of uh, Ronald Byrd, for example, Ronald Byrd is an influential social, science, uh, social networks person who brought in the idea of structural holes and brokerage. And what he argued was that, well, if you're in a network and you occupy a position which, where you can interact with a lot of people who do not know each other, that is a great position to be in because you're going to get a lot of diverse information from different sources and these people are not going to know about these, this information. So you are in a position of brokerage, where you can connect one person with that information, with another person with another information. And that's where opportunity lies. And this person, uh, and Professor Burt, finds that in banking, people who occupy these kind of structural holes, um, these people do much better vis-a-vis -vis people who are part of cliques. So that's one uh, limit of information, that, um, of, of embeddedness, that you don't get options. You get what you get. You get what your networks provide you. The second important issue is that, well, uh, one way through which embeddedness works is through um, reputation. So it can maintain your reputation in this network. But um, some recent work by Emily Cadence, uh, who is a legal scholar at Northwestern, she has questioned the effectiveness of reputation. So she asks if in case um, Reputation, reputation is such a credible way to know somebody's credibility. Because, so she goes back to um, medieval England and looks at these court records. And she finds that even though uh, people had bad reputation, they would still excel in business. Uh, they sometimes would even uh, reach to important positions in city councils and so forth. But more what she finds is that, well, the problem with reputation is that reputation can always be damaged through gossip. It doesn't have to be, reputation is not some very hard to uh, repeat uh, thing. So it can be easily damaged and it can easily be salvaged. So if you are somebody who have really committed a bad crime, well, you can always salvage your reputation by PR. And we see this in modern times too with all sorts of spin that we see in the media. Uh, so she has questioned the very fundamental notion that repu rep reputation, which we economists often think to be a very uh, solid way to maintain um, order is actually not so 
so great or not so effective, at least when we go back to, um, uh, to medieval period. And she makes a very profound point that, look, cheating is central to commerce. When you do commerce, cheating is fundamental in, uh, in commerce, and traders have to learn to tolerate it. That's how business has happened. Now, uh, there are critiques of her work. People say that because you look at criminal records, so you have a rather, um, you know, you have this view that cheating is central to commerce, but whether or not cheating is central to commerce, it's important to keep in mind that commerce is organized around um, minimizing the cheating. And cheating is a fundamental problem which all businesses are trying to grapple with. And uh, all the institutions we organize, all the systems we, we build, are in some sense ways to ensure that proper, reliable way of doing business can happen. Do you think? Uh, You're right. But economics has found a more respectable word for it, opportunism. Opportunism, yeah. So <laughs> opportunism is the same word. <laughs> uh, opportunism, uh, dishonesty, unreliable behavior. In fact, in my own thesis, I have kind of done find and replace of these words many times uh, because it's always very difficult to get the right word. Uh, but opportunism is another way to put it, and uh, business is having a lot of places of moral hazard. So there are limits to what em embeddedness can provide. Now let's look at the ugly part of embeddedness, which often gets ignored, but lately people have been starting to talk more about it. First of all, the basic problem with embeddedness is that it's kind of God-given. If in case you are in a position in your network which is valuable, resourceful, you are having a lot of social capital at your disposal. While if in case you're someone who is not having all that resources and embeddedness in your place, you are kind of not in a position to do anything. So there's a fundamental inequality when we look at the resources you can acquire through embeddedness. And what this does is, so try to imagine, um, the same, loan, uh, the same loan situation where you have, uh, you want to get a loan and because the getting loan with impersonal agents is, uh, ha is difficult, uh, the interest rates on, of these banks is very high and the most preferred route for you is to get a loan from a person you know. Do you think this is a good uh, way to structure a society or an economy where credit is given by family members or close rich banking friends? Is that how you would like to organize your economy? Uh, not really. Uh, we won't like to do that because while some people may have rich banking friends, other people may not. And if it's embeddedness and relationships and power which is going to drive um, credit markets and all other so job markets, it's going to create scope for nepotism. It's going to create scope where if I am someone in a position of power and I see an in incumbent coming in uh, it to my place, I'm going to use all my resources, because I'm richer in my resources, to erect barriers of entry. And this is what used to happen with uh, merchant guilds, which were thought to be these great ways of organizing business in the medieval period. But members of a merchant guilds uh, had a great uh, incentive to stop other people from entering the merchant guild, because if in case they could stop them, well, they will make, uh, we will have, they have more money more, more for themselves in the pie. Um, uh, merchant guilds would also do censorship of in information which uh, was not something that they would like to divulge to others. But they are, these are the problems of embeddedness um, when it is unequal. The second problem is that it limits opportunity. So what is fundamental about these, uh, the, the relational and power-based ways of doing business is that they all are built around a person's identity. So you identify a person, and then you do business with that particular person. This will be a contractual way of doing things where you do business with just about anybody you want to do business with. So what this does is that it embeddedness creates, makes identity very important. You want to know what is the identity of the person before you want to do business with this person. Now, it may be a good way of organizing business for some people, but if you belong to a lower caste, or you are even a woman, you may face um, discrimination because of the norm, the culture, or n number of different things. Because suddenly, instead of what you 
has to offer. What becomes more important is that what is your background, where do you come from, what is the information I can acquire you through your sources, and so forth. So what in the end happens is that while you could think of this network as a trusted network, first of all, because of the limits of embeddedness, this is not a trusted network. And B, um, not everyone is in a position to do an impersonal trade with this particular person. And so suddenly, while A would like to do business with B, this person is not able to because of all these different limitations that are placed in, the, in them. So, so let's look at the merchant guild system. So we try to understand the good, bad, and the ugly of embeddedness. So a very profound, uh, so in fact, more so than corporations, for about 1080 to around 1800 AD in Europe, merchant guilds were the predominant way of doing business. We don't think about them anymore. Uh, we think corporations are, they have always existed and they will always exist. But the truth is, they're very trans transitional organizations. And places like I'm Bangalore should think about it that, you know, is a, a corporation or a firm, as we think of it today, going to survive 50 years of the, say, the information technology revolution? Um, because it may not. Because, uh, because the fundamental way of doing business for a very long time was merchant guilds, not uh, corporations. And we have totally forgotten about them. So what were they like? So these were very complex, multiplex networks, where networks existed on various levels of hierarchy. So, Networks would, ex they were economic networks, they were social networks, they were cultural networks, and people would socialize with each other, and so forth. And the purpose, from an economic perspective of all this, was to create a dense network where you can collect information, where you can monitor each other, and you can uh, get things done through this web of networks that you, that you had. So that was the fundamental advantage of a merchant guild, which were basically associations of wholesale traders. But while there were these advantages, um, theoretical advantages, there was a problem, which was that all these guilds had a strong incentive, as I said, to stop new people from coming in. Because why would you want it? So what, it did, what happened is that it turned from a club to a clique. So it was supposed to be a club of people where people could get common goods generated, uh, common benefits generated, pooled together. But what eventually happened is that they turned into cliques. So, for, so this is like a graph of uh, four cities, Antwerp, Amsterdam in Northwestern Europe, Bruges, which is also in Northwestern Europe, and Bilbao, um, where you see that until 1500 or so, um, guilds in general, the average level of control that a guild had was pretty large on, on so this were, these were no, not simply uh, clubs of people coming together and like having some social activity and talking about each other. At least, on an average, they had the power to politically represent the, the individual trader. And actually, when you look at the actual differences, there were some very powerful uh, guilds which had the ability to discipline uh, people, which had the ability to restrict membership and so forth. Now, suddenly, after 1500, the power of guilds began to decline. At the same time when notaries or um, members of uh, or impersonal market started to emerge. So, so in places like Antwerp and Amsterdam, when uh, merchant guilds declined, markets emerged. So this was like a, uh, like a mirror uh, decline and rise, which is the kind of topic of the next uh, lecture. Um, the best way to think about a guild uh, is to think about taxi associations. So, um, so, so I was in London, so London uh, had a very legendary uh, London Taxi Association. Uh, Calcutta, so I am also from Calcutta, so Calcutta also has a pretty famous yellow, yellow cabs. And um, so there are two ways you can think about these uh, associations. The first fundamental thing they do is that they vet drivers. So it's not easy to be a, a you don't want uh, anyone to be a taxi driver. That's not what you want because you want reliability. And one of the things that taxi associations did was that they wedded people. So London had this famous thing called the knowledge. So you had to know every street. A driver had to first know every street of London. And, that, and learning that actually increased the size of the hippocampus. And once they had learned it, only th and they had to pass the test. And then they could get the license of being a taxi driver. So, there were very stringent uh, requirements that made sure that the reputation of the taxi driver 
was high. This person was not someone who, should, who would just run away. So you erected all these barriers to entry for a fair reason, that you wanted good people, committed people to enter. So while the, the intention is good, but then it creates problems. So, um, so I went to London in 2012, and this is a time when Uber had not really arrived. So I had a very glorious and very positive notion of what a merchant guild, uh, sorry, what a taxi uh, association is. I thought these are iconic cabs, etc., etc. Very soon Uber arrives, and the same taxi association suddenly starts to wield its, uh, uh, its power uh, and starts to organize protests. Well, that's fine, they had the power to protest. But while you were being charged, for example, 50 pounds for a, for a journey in a, in a taxi association driven car, you were charged about 25 pounds through Uber. And this fundamental difference became a problem and suddenly people's perceptions changed. From being this extremely reliable service, it turned into an anti-consumerist clique in a very short span of time. And you saw this transition happening in front of your eyes. Actually, I was very surprised to see how in Calcutta, Uber and Ola could get a sizable market share because I would have thought that the level of opposition that these services would get in Calcutta especially would be much higher. But um, it seems like uh, Ola and uh, Uber have done pretty well in these cities. But the idea is that the same uh, intention of erecting barriers can be for a good reason, that you want good people to come in. So for example, I am Bangalore has a high entry barrier because so that people who are really committed, who are really good, can then get an education. But then sometimes clubs turn into cliques. And this is kind of the fundamental problem of traditional business. So you can always organize business in terms of clubs where you have a relationship-based structure, you have a power-based structure, but then once you have built all that, people suddenly have an incentive to simply turn it into a way for insiders to make a lot of money through monopolies. So there, these are three modes of exchange, and I, I'm going to uh, have time, so we're going to talk about it. So, um, so there are three modes. Uh, so there's relational mode, there's a mode of power, there's contractual mode. And in terms of relational exchange, what drives it is having trust in someone. So you have trust in somebody. Um, so I'm going to talk about this um, in detail in the next slide. So the idea here is that, well, these three different modes of doing business are very distinct from each other. They have different advantages and disadvantages. And essentially, when we try to talk about modern business, uh, we have to do an accounting exercise of which of the benefits and which of the losses you, you have, et cetera. So uh, when you think about these three modes of exchange, and you especially think about relational exchange, uh, it's driven by trust. You have trust in someone, um, or you want to build trust with someone, and based on that particularized trust, trust in a particular person, you are able to build these relationships. And what this does is that it creates embeddedness. So you, uh, you, you get into long-term relationships with people, and um, you stick to these relationships. You form networks, long-term networks, and when you are in these ne embedded networks, the kind of um, understanding you build, the kind of management style you create is tacit because it's built in a long-term relationship. So the best example of this is uh, the Japanese uh, just-in-time production system where you are not in a contractual world. You have built these long-term relationships with your suppliers. And then once you have built these long-term supply, uh, uh, supply chains, the, the knowledge that is in between the supplier and, the, and, the, and, and Toyota is something very unique and it is not easy to mimic all over the place because there is some level of implicitness, informality or tacitness in this particular way of doing things. Now in general, when you think about traditional business, the, the management style used to be more informal, more tacit because it was largely built around two individuals who are going to have a long-term relationship. And once you have this informal structure of doing things, you rather would like to continue doing things with the same person rather than going off and doing things with somebody new. So the cost of breaking a relationship becomes more, more difficult. So it kind of is a self-fulfilling kind of a equilibrium to be in. The second example, uh, notion is of power. So you want to acquire a firm if in case you see that this firm has a very high degree of complementarity with your business. So if there is high level of comp complementarity, you think, why do I need to keep it in with someone else? Let me just hire the firm because then I can have full integration with my business. And what this builds is a hierarchy 
Um, so you have you build these hierarchical structures, and if we have organized society where we, everything, every mode of transaction is through ownership and power, then we are going to get all these hierarchies, and we are going to get concentration. We are going to get large vertically integrated firms, <coughs> and in these vertically integrated firms, like say um, a Che Bol in in China, in Korea, where these, these hierarchies exist with, say, Hyundai, which has these n number of businesses and automobile being just one of it. Uh, you, the kind of management style you get is a command uh, management style. You, you, it's a command-driven management style. And once you're in that kind of equilibrium again, um, that creates another ways of acquiring more power, acquiring more uh, control, and so forth. So, but what is common between these two structures is that they're all particularized. They are all about doing, exert, building long-term relationship with a particular person or a particular firm, or exerting control and power over a particular relationship or a particular firm. So these are both particularized way of doing things. Contractual exchange is kind of different, um, where you need to have some sort of institutions and generalized institutions which can fairly administer these contracts. And these are very essential. And the whole point of the next lecture would be that, well, these are not so easy to get. So these are not some magic bullet which you can, can just get and the problem is resolved. But as long as you can have these kind of institutions, they can favor contractual exchange. And when you have contractual exchange, uh, you have options. You don't need to be, you, the way you organize your business is not around a particular individual, but around the market. You want to formalize, you want to um, build in structures, you want to build in, uh, get into, have written records, you want to do stuff which is going to make you more attractive in the market for anybody, not just a particular individual. And, um, and then the more contractible you become through the adoption of formalization, so for example, ISO is a good example of uh, of, of, a, of, a, of a standardization that firms wish to adopt. And once you have become more and more contractible, once more, you become more and more good for a general market, it further uh, pushes for contractibility. So this is like a general um, structure, and it's kind of my work in progress. So I don't have no claims that it's 100% correct. So I would be quite glad to hear some contrary points if in case somebody thinks so. Uh, any doubts on it, though? It's a complex graph. I'm still working on it, so. OK, so let's go ahead. So let's get into back to, the, to, um, to history. So um, this is a very useful uh, slide, the uh, quote that I find by Sheila Ogilvy, who wrote this uh, seminal book in 2011 on institutions and trade in, uh, in Europe between 1080 to 1880. And uh, here she kind of succinctly describes, one, the way in which the rise of the stranger and how that created the rise of Northwestern Europe. So what she's basically arguing is that, well, um, Italy and um, Spain and German, Germany were all in this traditional mode of doing business where they were doing business through guilds. They're doing business through guilds, so they were doing business focused around individuals, particular individuals, and they were building institutions focused around particular individuals. Now, something happened in low countries, which is Netherlands and Belgium and England. And what this did is that there was a rise of increasingly impersonal markets and impartial states. Um, and as people started to do business with strangers, it uh, started to give rise to um, a different way of doing business because you no longer had to focus on a particular individual. So, uh, so that's why um, this is the rise of the stranger. Um, now, what were the changes that were happening in Northwestern Europe? First of all, uh, guild monopolies started to decline. So while for a long time, guilds used to have these privileges and they had control over a particular jurisdiction, now suddenly uh, in places like uh, Hamburg, which is actually in Germany, uh, Antwerp, Amsterdam, London, the power of the guild started to decline, and in its place started to rise the role of public notaries. So these notaries came in, and you could just write a partnership with someone, and there was some level of institutional support. So 
We often assume, by the way, that courts have always existed, and courts have always been effective at, at enforcing contracts. That has never been the case. Courts may, may or may not like, uh, have had the power to adjudicate justice, but the power of the court has largely been limited. Uh, even in a state like China, which is quite pow powerful, the court was not meant for you know, dispute resolution of, of contracts. That was not the purpose of the court. So suddenly, um, there's this rise of public notaries, and there's, this, there's the rise of these, in general, institutions that are going to help any individual merchant and not somebody who's a member of a particular guild or so. So, so now you could just be a merchant who goes into Amsterdam and you will get all the services that the city has to provide with a we, anyone else who is a member of any guild. So this is a fundamental shift where, where, the, where institutions move from being particularized to generalized. Uh, once there was a rise of public notaries and so forth, people started to go and get their businesses and partnerships written. And as things became more, more and more in writing, there was a rise of recording things. There was a rise of accounting. So one of the very fascinating facts that I did not know was that Europeans did not know um, uh, the Hindu Arabic number system as commoners uh, until 1500. They didn't know how to divide because they didn't know the decimal system. They were still following the Roman numbers. Uh, so well, the mathematicians did know, but uh, the common merchants were not well trained and educated in, um, in arithmetic. Now suddenly, uh, with the printing press, uh, people started to learn about the decimal system. And they started to do division. And they started to do accounting. And as those things began to rise, so, you are, so now you have a notary who would be willing to administer written records as evidence in any kind of dispute. So you have an incentive to record things. And then once you start to record things, once you start to measure things, once you start to put in accounting systems in place, uh, there's a rise of formalization of business. So you have a lot of this information coming for you, uh, coming to you and you're able to um, organize all this information in a much more um, proper, proper manner. And the most important distinction, which actually Max Weber pointed at, was that there began a distinction between home and work. So for a long time, you know, you're a family firm, you're a business, and uh, you know, your home and your work are kind of mixed. Uh, nobody even gives it a thought that these may not need to be mixed. They can sometimes be different. Now, because of accounting, um, there was a rise of this division, that there's a home domain and there's a work domain. And the objective of the work domain is, to, is more suited in terms of making a profit, um, expanding capital. You, first of all, you've got to know what your amount of money you have. So these kind of changes started to emerge with increasing formalization. And the, the cultural change that happened that, that uh, Deirdre McCloskey at times talks about is that being a merchant no longer remained a bad thing that you know, very greedy people do. Uh, it became like an art. It became a science where you had to learn a lot before you could be a merchant. Once that happened, there was also the rise of the stock market. So as you have more, mer more merchants doing business, the ruler thinks, well, you know, why do I need to get money from these specific merchant guilds? Let me just raise taxes, or let me build a public stock market where I can gain capital, um, which is only going to happen if you have a base of merchants to do this. Once you had that, you had the evolution of the joint stock company, where you, know, you had these pretty sophisticated firms, and you had the notion of a share, and you combine the two, uh, and you get the joint stock company, which is the predominant form of doing business today. So, and this emerged in, uh, in Amsterdam and in London. So I just wanted to chart this course of, one, joint stock company is not something which we can take for granted. It is something that came pretty recently, and uh, it, it came in 1600, it's not very far back, but uh, these were monopolies. So East India Company in no way was a very, the English East India Company was not like a very nice company to Indians especially. Same, same is with, true with uh, the Dutch East India Company. So these were monopolies nonetheless. So these were publicly owned monopolies. Unlike say it, uh, Spanish monopolies, which are ruler based, rulership, ruler owned monopolies. So they were fundamentally different, but they were still not wide enough. So they, these are multinational corporations with apparently the size of five trillion. Today, the valuation of 
Dutch East India Company would be five trillion dollars. So, if, uh, so that was the size of the firm. That was the scope of the firm. And this sophistication could arise through all these managerial systems and structures that came in its place. And uh, once this had happened, um, so an interesting thing is New York, which was, again, a home to a lot of business innovations, is essentially a Dutch city in a British colony. So again, the Dutch and the British had a huge role to play in modernizing uh, business, as we know. So now, uh, once you've talked about that, let's go back to Indian business and um, go back to Professor Tripathi, who, um, who obviously challenged uh, this notion that entrepreneurs in India are cultural. They are not economic. So they have a fatalist mindset. So we don't even value um, making money. Um, uh, that's what was the perception of Max Weber, that it's a fatalist culture uh, where fate decides everything. We, have, we are in a structure of Varna. And because of all that, we don't have the drive to progress the way Europeans had. So he was also the progenitor of the Protestant ethic which claimed that, well, Protestant ethic was special because it motivated hardworking, industrious individuals. Now, Professor Tripathi comes in and he starts to look at Indian businesses and he says, well, you know, I don't really believe in this narrative, this cultural narrative of India. And I think just the way we can explain uh, any business in any part of the world, we can look at Indian businesses from the same materialist lens. That is, let's not put culture before simple economic uh, uh, or social, simple organizational principles, once we have accounted for all those things, we will then account for all these other idiosyncratic reasons that may happen. So if you asked him if in case what drove um, Gujaratis into being um, so successful, he would not say, well, Gujaratis have this special mindset. All he will say is that, well, you know, Gujaratis had this long coast, which was having many ports, and because of this large port, uh, you know, it was easy for you to do uh, business um, in this part of the world. So they became more entrepreneurial. It's not a rocket science that a region with, and actually when you think about the key trading regions of India, you observe that um, Gujarat, Kerala, these are all um, coastal regions. And coastal regions, and, and similarly Netherlands is a coastal region. It is a coastal region. Coastal regions in general tend to be more open. They tend to be more, um, stranger oriented, they tend to have more cosmopolitan cultures. And the problem with Indian historiography, which continues to be the case, is that when we look at, the, for example, the GDP figures of India, historically, we're going to compare one India to a small Italy, which makes no sense. Because while Italy was significantly richer than India at all parts, at least until from 1000 AD, but if you start to break down India into smaller units, and you start to look at the wealth of Kerala or wealth of, of uh, uh, Gujarat or the wealth of Bengal or the wealth of, say, some region around Banaras, those will be significantly much more richer, most probably, vis-a-vis -vis, um, other parts. So there's a fallacy of sorts in comparing India to Netherlands or to, 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 to Italy. And we need to kind of break these uh, GDP figures and so forth down into smaller regions before we can truly say something about them. So uh, today, obviously, Indian businesses are also going through transformation. And they're following the same patterns that in the past other countries, and including the first one, uh, Netherlands and England, had. So there's a decline of embeddedness. So once upon a time, the, the nameplate company for India would be a Tata or a Pirla. Now you have uh, startups like Ola and Flipkart, which kind of increasingly become more dominant. Now, it does not mean that, there, that you, know, you can be anybody with any uh, background and you can be an entrepreneur in this country. But increasingly so, at least an, a mindset has emerged that you can be an entrepreneur, even though your family is not an entrepreneurial uh, family or it does not come from a wealthy background. So that uh, mindset has changed. And in part, that is because of uh, the institutions that have emerged. Uh, an institution, say, for example, uh, NSR Cell at IM Bangalore is doing something which is highly uncharacteristic. That is, it is teaching people how to do business, which, I mean, 50 years ago would not be something that people will think is part of, of education. So, and it kind of links very uh, perfectly with this rise of, uh, of Ars Mercatoria in Northwestern Europe. So, 
in India uh, now, like for example, when I graduated, uh, um, out of 10 of my friends, around seven of them became entrepreneurs because even their parents thought that entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship was a good um, business uh, in, uh, industry to be in. Uh, why has this happened? Because now increasingly managerial education is, edu is respected. You don't have to be an engineer or a doctor. If you're a businessman and you have a plan in place, that's a respectable thing to do, which is very different from a uh, long back ago when you know, uh, so being a, a businessman was something you thought of as a swindler or somebody who makes quick buck. In fact, there's a very interesting um, uh, research by, um, by Professor Nuharia, uh, which talks about how the description of the businessman has evolved in, in Bollywood. So while in the 1950s and the 1960s, uh, the merchant used to be this really bad person who used to take all the poor people's wealth and you know, uh, swindle them. And increasingly now, um, merchants are, and businessmen are considered to be like heroes. And uh, mm -hmm. who are, so this is a cultural shift that uh, we are observing in India, where there's a change in how we view things. Uh, third is, of course, there are more public companies, and there's an expansion of the stock market, where um, we observe this um, major um, rise and it's rather an explosion of amount of capital that's infusing into India. And so all this uh, points towards the fact that there is a lot of transformation happening, but there's a problem that it does not mean that embeddedness is going away or that it has to go away, first of all. Um, for, it's not so because there's a huge divergence. So you have a city like Bangalore, which kind of uh, is a great example of what this transformation looks like of traditional to modern. I think if that's how, if, if there's one way you want to criticize, uh, uh, characterize uh, Bangalore, is that it's kind of the face of the transformation of Indian business. But at the same time, for every Bangalore, you have a city like Patna or Lucknow, which is not really on the race of progress or, or on the race of this transformation. So this is something that really fascinated me when I came to, I mean, when it struck me that. Uh, this region, uh, which comprises of UP, Bihar, MP, um, Charkhand, and Chhattisgarh, has about half a billion people living in that region, and it has zero metropolitan cities. So all cities have grown around this circle. So Bangalore, Hyderabad, Pune, uh, Delhi, all these are outside of this circle. And with this, within, this, within this circle, there is no ri rise of a large uh, metropolitan city. Now, in economic theory, uh, in business evolution, a city is the most important unit for growth because it is a city. It's the, what the national government does for its policy is kind of immaterial because uh, the, the, the life of an entrepreneur is not going to be influenced by the national policy quite often. It's going to be influenced by the level of institutions, quality of institutions you have in your individual cities. And in cities where um, Basically, capital, uh, finance, and labor can match together. It creates effective matching and uh, growth. But if you don't have cities, what happens is that people stay in villages. And if you have a, little, a very high threshold to leave village because you're not finding opportunities in that embedded, embedded society, you, you move to Bangalore or you move to Bombay. But if you have a lower threshold, you want to move, but you don't have the option to move, you're still stuck in the village and you can't move. Now, arrival of a single city, hopefully, what, what it can do is that it pushes all those people who are more marginal in their willingness to move towards cities and they can grasp more opportunities and so forth. So, uh, so there's a metropolis vacuum uh, in this particular half billion people. Like half a billion is like, um, I mean, too many uh, one and a half United States and there is not a single, or the entire European Union and you, you do not have a single city uh, to attract people or to focus people on. And that's one of the flaws of India's uh, urban planning, which it doesn't really get that much of emphasis when you think about it. So you don't have proper mayor systems. Uh, you don't have local governance. Apparently, Bangalore has five different jurisdictions to, um, to, do, uh, to run the city, which makes no sense when a city, say, like London or New York, has a mayor who has who's, who's for the activities related to the city. So 
the Constitution of India was written in 1947 and uh, no, 1950. In the end, it was written in 1950. And uh, during this time, um, well, people had a rural thought of India. So it, India was thought to be a rural country. And the mindset was that India is a country of villages. Well, that was not true in the first place. India was a city with astonishing level of urban sophistication. For example, um, the guilds that we talked about in Europe, we recently learned that giant guilds used to exist in South India, which uh, in the Chola Empire. Chola Empire used to have a vast trading network in uh, Southeast Asia. Um, and this kind of a village view of India, where everything is like embedded in caste and uh, you know, patriarchy and so forth, that particular view has a kind of distorted our own understanding of India, which like every other part of the world, had its entrepreneurs, had its businessmen, who were doing business in the traditional way. And as uh, proper institutions emerge, they will be able to um, take on the, 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 the mantle of, of growth as, as they come. So that's a major um, flaw in the, way, the very way we have designed or thought about India as a country, where we have undermined the importance of urban institutions, urban governance, etc. And when you look at something like Antwerp or Amsterdam, which were like the heart of this business revolution that happened, they, this was all driven by the local rulers. It had nothing to do with the you know, overall um, king of the, of the region. It had not, London's rise had nothing to do with the queen, uh, per se. It was the local city mayor who was really bringing about all this change. And uh, this uh, mindset, when we think about India, we think about India, and instead of not thinking about Bangalore or thinking about um, you know, Patna or all, all these particular cities and their governance structures is a fallacy uh, that we need to rectify in terms of policy, in terms of research, etc., etc. So let me conclude and then we can open for questions. So kind of today's talk was about uh, how relational and power-based exchange have dominated traditional business because the contractual option doesn't really exist. Um, economic exchange is embedded in networks and hierarchies and it is able to inefficiently resolve some of these market frictions of information asymmetry and, mark, uh, and moral hazard. And, but at the same time, business creates inequalities. It creates, uh, it creates, creates, gives rise to discrimination, etc. And uh, some examples of uh, embeddedness is the guild system or the taxi, taxi association, which ha the whole idea is to be a club, but they have turned into a clique. Um, and once you have generalized institutions in place, they can boost contractability, increase competition, uh, increase formalization, and in reduce embeddedness and so forth. But the problem is that generalized institutions are not a magic wand. Primarily why they are not a magic wand? Because institutions are prone to capture and they have always been prone to cap capture. As we talk about markets and capitalism, for example, we have to talk about crony capitalism. They are like shadow and uh, you know, body and shadow. So uh, that's going to be the theme for, for the next, uh, next lecture, where we're going to talk about how, um, so for example, these, these changes, these forces of evolution, everybody wants to have contractual exchange. If you give people the freedom, they will naturally and spontaneously love to build a court system, which will uh, efficiently you know, adjudicate all contracts. The problem is that even though you try multiple times, because of the power of special interest, all these institutions will fail, even though we keep on trying again and again and again. And it's only under specific conditions that the, those institutions can emerge. And this is what kind of happened in, uh, in Netherlands and in, uh, in England. Not perfectly, so it's not that in 1600, um, England was a utopia, far from it. It was actually uh, quality of life at a certain point became worse in, in around 17, 1800 with the Industrial Revolution and so forth. But it's not about good or bad. It's simply that the wheel of change kind of emerged in that region and then um, it kind of contagiously affected other parts of the world. Um, now that's one way to look at things, obviously, and there can be alternate ways to look at the entire history. Um, so for, with that, like I think I'm done for today. So we can have some questions for like 15, 20 minutes. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you.
Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I was just wondering if you. Very interesting uh, way you have presented the evolution of uh, markets and hierarchies. You haven't touched the markets as you're talking about embeddedness and hierarchies. But if you bring in the element of uh, technology and its evolution, so how does the picture actually change? You know, does it sort of make this relationship between uh, embeddedness and hierarchies on one side and market? It's a kind of a very fluctuating relationship because. So uh, basically, my entire thesis is about the impact of the printing press on, uh, on the emergence of markets. So technology is central to that change. So the thing is this. If you have a self-evolving system uh, where you know, things are self-reinforcing, so you have relational exchange giving rise to relational exchange, or you have power-based exchange giving rise to power-based ex exchange. In that kind of world, you need some sort of an exogenous shock to change the order of things. If you don't have that exogenous shock, um, things will not happen. So uh, the point for the next class would exactly be that while things were in this equilibrium all over the world, because of these two particular revolutions that struck Northwestern Europe the most, one was the Atlantic revolution of commercial, the commercial revolution, where the Atlantic trade suddenly became important uh, for good or bad reasons. Uh, I mean, Atlantic trade also gave rise to slavery, but because um, it eventually gave rise to slavery, but once you were at the frontier of Atlantic trade, you suddenly had a lot of incentive to do business with this stranger. Um, oh wait, yeah, with a stranger. So while previously I would not want to do business with the stranger simply because what's the profit? Why do I need to do business with somebody I don't know? But suddenly with this Atlantic trade coming in, you suddenly had a great incentive to do business with this unknown person because this is, person is living a bit distantly. But what the money you can make by doing business with your close networks and friends and the money you can make with doing business with a stranger suddenly changes. But that's just one revolution. And actually, that revolution struck Spain. It struck many parts of the world. Uh, when you think about the Indian coast, India, India's Malabar coast was, or the Gujarat, uh, or Gujarat, were exceptionally rich with opportunities for long distance trade. But the markets did not emerge in these places. Because the second factor, which is the printing press, which suddenly comes in and has a profound <coughs> change in the availability of information. So when you think about the basic benefit of embeddedness, it is that it's a rich conduit of information. You can get good information about people that you would not know otherwise. Now, it's important to keep in mind that what kind of society we are talking about in, 1500, in 1400. You had no internet, of course. You had no phone, you had no telegraph. You had no postal system developed at that point. And books were as expensive. One book used to cost as much as a laptop today. That was the cost of a book before printing press. So this is the world we are talking about. And the entire world was in this information poverty. Now, it does not mean that they didn't have information. It just meant that they had all the information through their networks. So networks was the central conduit of information. Now, printing press comes in, and suddenly there's an explosion of books, pamphlets, merchant manuals, which uh, kind of democratize information for everyone in that region. And while, say, the Ottomans, in fact, for uh, their, uh, uh, sadly, what they did, censored uh, the printing press around in the late 1490s because they thought that these, uh, the printing press would corrupt uh, their scriptures. Uh, well, it's not so that Europe didn't have these uh, in inclinations. It's just that the, the, the expansion of the printing press was so fast and explosive that by the time it reached uh, like, you know, ro the, the Roman Catholic Church and so forth, um, kind of uh, the, the explosion had already happened. And that by that time, it didn't make sense for the Pope to kind of control information, but rather than manage it. So they focused more on counter-reformation, for example, rather than uh, censoring things because they knew that they can no longer censor things. So uh, there's a political story to it, but technology is central to this all and everything that's happening. So if in case institutions and culture are constant, the only thing that can change is technology. So, so that's what uh, the next lecture would sort of be about, but then, the, then the, the, the third one about forces of evolution is largely about that. Where when you think about a particular equilibrium, so that's the second thing that often historians do not think much about is in terms of equilibrium, that 
So things can exist in equilibrium. A lot can be happening in India from you know, 1080 to 1580 or so. But the question is that, is an evolution happening? Is a fundamental change happening in society? Or is it just that one ruler is uh, taking place of second one, and the third one, and the fourth one? That's one way to look at history. But another way to think about history is that how has actual lives of people changed over time? And the pace of technological change in all parts of the world was very, very slow. So today we give, live in an assumption that progress is obvious. Like our life, our, we will have this technology and the next generation will have even better technology and the generation before us had worse technology. But if you were in 1300, that was not the case. Your, your quality of life and the conditions you lived in was kind of very similar to the one that your grand parents lived in and your grandparents lived in. It was, there was no new iPhone coming in for in your generation. Whatever your grandparents used is what you used as well, largely speaking. So when you think about all these innovations that India did or China did, uh, they all did all that, of course. But they did that over such a long period of time that nobody is going to see all this massive technological change every few years because that's not what's happening. It's like somebody did something in once, then 100 years later somebody did something else. Nobody gets to know. People slowly adopt these changes. Now suddenly after, in the early modern period, the pace of change of technology also expands rapidly. Um, there are various explanations, like there's one school uh, which claims that printing press played a very important role in that change because suddenly you had information the way um, you didn't used to have before. And basically you got a public sphere. You got a way through which you could get information beyond just your hierarchical networks and your vertical peers. You could get information directly. You could read anyone you wish to, uh, which was not possible before because people didn't have books to read. So that's the fundamental change uh, that happens, which is technological. I uh, have three questions. Okay. Okay. Uh, some of them just observations and reflection. Thanks for this uh, great presentation because Thanks. I come from exactly the opposite view, dominantly cultural in the way I look at it, but I've also, also reflected on the economic perspective to looking at it. The first one is I just, uh, through the presentation, what I was struck by is the kind of temporality assumptions with which you kind of looked at the presentation. Mm -hmm. So there were a thousand years and then you kind of said 500 years to, yeah. And all along the questions in my head really rooted in the cultural perspective were really, um, is there, I mean, we look at events and episodic ways of looking at transformation, mm -hmm. evolution. Mm -hmm. So I wondered whether there was an economic lens to being able to view uh, events and episodes. And I love the printing press, and I want to pick that up because so it has just just uh, the, the point of clarification is really that um, the printing press was uh, uh, was profound for the fact that it made information accessible to societies that were very strongly feudal, mm -hmm. which allowed for ways of thinking, which can which in turn kind of got you yes. the entire ideas of uh, innovation and change and all of that. So, so I'm just kind of stuck in that. Uh, so the irony is that while I did start by criticizing the cultural view, but uh, my thesis, uh, at least the third chapter, is largely, I'm not like creating sure. a dichotomy that this exists and this does not exist. In fact, on the contrary, in the last 10, 15 years, mm -hmm. there's a rise of cultural economics. Which, is, um, which argues that, well, there are fundamental cultural differences between societies. Now, they can be explained by material explanations, but there are some changes. Most importantly, trust. The trust is something which uh, is fundamentally important. Now, um, actually, I uh, come from that view. I come that from the view that material culture, in the end, influences culture. Mater materials influence culture, and then influence and that culture then drives a lot of progress. So, for example, um, Joel Mokir or Deirdre McCloskey, these are not proponents of, so Deirdre McCloskey says something, uh, case, some, something very bluntly that it is not coal or silver that built the modern world. It cannot be so that it's coal and silver that built the modern world. It has to be ideas. And uh, the culture of 
generating new ideas. One of the things that uh, Joel Mokir points out is that the fundamental difference between Europeans and Chinese. So uh, first of all, both of them agree that around 1500, if you had to make a bet on which part of the world is going to grow faster, based on the material conditions, you would have said that it's China or India that's going to be ahead. Because uh, Euro we are talking about Northwestern Europe, is, which is just a corner of the entire Eurasian landmass, which didn't have much significance before 1500. Now, what Joel Mokir points at is that in this context, Europeans became a bit different in their attitude towards technology and ideas. They became greedy in the sense that they found a great idea anywhere and they will pick it up and bring it to, to their society. So when you look at uh, English products, they call, they, they call the, 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 uh, the, the plates, etc., China. They, they are not uh, uh, averse to calling things from their place of origin. So they're happy to acknowledge that we have acquired this knowledge, this thing from this part of the world. In contrast, the Chinese and the Indians, despite their um, technological um, advancements, for example, China, India had a very big advantage in maritime technology. But while it, the Europeans and the Portuguese, they were, the Portuguese and the British, they were constantly adopting and adapting all these technologies in their societies, India was not doing the latter. And, and something that is claimed and something that I want to study myself, this particular moment around 1550 or 1600, when the Portuguese and the Indians met each other, what was the dynamic of this transaction? Because um, the claim is that while the Portuguese started to learn a lot from Indians, the other way did not happen. So for example, we have this uh, stereotypical kind of story that when Jahangir was given the map of uh, India, of the world, he claimed that, well, why do I need the world map when I'm already the king of the world? So that kind of isolated mindset um, gave rise to, uh, led to less learning. And partly this could also be because of the printing press. So it's important to understand that printing press would not have succeeded in India, simply because Indian script is harder to print. So the, the, the Roman script has only 26 alphabets. So you can basically build 26 wood blocks and you can print whatever you want. In contrast, um, the Devanagari script, for example, has uh, these 35 constants and then these 12 vowels, and then they have to be combined together. So you have these thousand or so like combinations and permutations that get formed. So printing these thousand combinations is much more costlier with a V26. And same with Chinese script, that they all actually invented the printing press before, but because the script had those some 3,000 characters, uh, it was hard to print it. So there are sometimes very idiosyncratic reasons why societies would not adopt uh, certain technologies. But once you have printing press, once you start to read the fact that Aristotle was, so that's one thing. The other difference that Mok Joel Mokir points at is that somewhere around 1600, uh, the mentality of Europeans changed from being that, hey, we, our ancestors knew more than us. And it changed to, we know more than our ancestors. And this is a very fundamental shift in the way uh, uh, knowledge was organized, which at, again can at times be linked to, uh, to printing press because they were reading Aristotle. And so one of the things happened was that when the Dutch, etc., would go on voyages and they will read what their ancestors wrote and they will see what they found, they started to finger, figure out that, look, it seems like our ancestors were not that smart as we think they were. And, um, this was not the case with uh, the Chinese or Indians, who always believe that all the wisdom and knowledge have, has already been discovered. It already exists in like some uh, 2,000, 3,000. The, the farther away you get, the more wisdom you can find. And all you have to do is discover that wisdom from the ancient past. Um, so that's the second uh, profound. So, and these two things are correlated. So once you know that your ancestors don't really know so much, then you're also keen to learn new things, and you're going to learn new things from all sorts of cultures and societies. So there's a, so actually the next week we are going to talk about these episodes and um, how it is in the end the culture that gets changed, not really the three modes of doing exchange, which is not the, it's, these, these are kind of key ingredients to think about the frameworks, but in the end you have to fit it with a kind of culture which is much harder to grapple, but it does bring a big change. The second one, and I uh, stop with that, is that I, I loved the idea that you, uh, I mean, the map that you put up of the India, the Metropolis gap. Yeah. That kind of triggered uh, 
for me, uh, the whole question of uh, plural, plural, plurality, okay, and I'm just kind of articulating it as I'm talking to you, so I'm not coherent. Uh, I was looking at plural, pluralism in conceptualizing, and so let me just uh, give an illustration because I'm uh, several years ago. Several several years ago, I was looking at a piece on uh, one India, multiple India, okay, cross cultural conceptualization of India, and we just looked at some economic data and put up that there are seven clusters in India, okay, and then I be, we began to look at institutional strength as one of the characteristics. So I'm now wondering whether there is some merit to go back to looking at the three exchange processes of uh, enterprises to the plural, pluralistic conception of so uh, there's, I mean, the, there's the IHDS data set, uh, by the way, the Indian Human Development Survey, which has a very rich record of who gets debt from whom. So you can always kind of map this relationship-based exchange to the more contractual exchange and see how this differ, differs across yeah. India. That's one thing you can do. Uh, so there are two things, for, because I think it's a good eye point to bring about plurality. So one of the fundamental things about uh, a market exchange, uh, say in Amsterdam or London, was the fact that it became a city that would get a lot of, it was the most cosmopolitan city of that particular time. And same is true, for example, at the moment in um, about um, Bangalore. So it's getting a lot of people from all over the places. And the more you're open to people, the more you are not caring about their identity, the more likely uh, that it's going to succeed. If you think about New York, again, it's a city which gets a lot of people together. And the reason why Japan has not been doing so well in part is because it has not opened its country the same way to all these uh, different um, types of people. So in part, uh, when you think about these different regions, there's also, so the way I think about, because I'm myself from Bihar, so I, the way I think about its culture is that it's still stuck in a very traditional kind of, in some sense it's quite medieval in its, uh, in its organization. And it's not because of the fault of Bihar per se, it's just that it has not got those shocks that um, it should have got. Um, for various reasons. Maybe it's fright equalization uh, that did it. Or maybe it's the fact that there was a uh, caste system is even a lot more entrenched in that particular region. There can be various reasons, but um, there's a kind of two, the more, um, in some sense, the more uh, market oriented a society becomes, the more uniform the culture is, like in many specific ways. And it's the non-market societies that are very specific or unique in their um, structures. But I may be wrong on this, so I'm not an expert. But if there is a coexistence of agricultural, manufacturing, and service and knowledge economies coexisting in this India, then why would we expect that uh, relational, ex I mean, exchanges so should So actually, to be honest, it would be very, very impossible to believe that the entire India would become like a giant marketplace. It's not possible because India is double the size of Europe, right? And in Europe, you have Western Europe and you have Eastern Europe. And the reasons why these two Europes are different is because one is located at the coast and the other one is not. So even from that perspective, it is possible that, uh, you know, there's a, distinct, there's a kind of a segregation of preferences. So people who want, the same is true with rural and urban America. Coastal America, uh, are, Americans are different in their culture in terms of uh, rural Americans, uh, they have very, very different preferences. And I think that's what's going to really happen, no, no matter how much pontification one gives. That's the cultural change that's going to emerge. But what is going to happen, as with Chinmay Tumbe's research, there's going to be a lot more migration. So what the, the Kannadiga of today and the Kannadiga of 50 years from now will be very different because Biharis will migrate to, uh, to this part. And there'll be a lot of space for everyone to come in. Because so that's uh, how it's going to be. One way maybe the fortunes of uh, this region, uh, Bihar region, can improve is if in case the, Gang uh, the Ganges, uh, Ganga becomes a more, uh, you know, the, that it becomes more coastal as a country, society. Like you, ships can come in, trade can happen. It is more at the frontier of trade. If that can be done or maybe some bullet trains can be brought in, it's hard to, to think about all that, but, um, but it's uh, hard, uh, it's not realistic to assume that uh, Bihar would be as rich as, say, Kerala one, once upon a, today because <coughs> people will might just might. 
And that's why the per capita income yeah. increases of Bihar. So, yeah. So thanks a lot. Uh, any questions? Yeah, uh, just I would like to, uh, has there been a study on the role of the modes of payment? Has it had an influence the way it over the So very recently, after demonetization, some people have started to study um, the modes of payment. Because, uh, but it's, demonetization is just two years old, so we don't know uh, is much about it. But demonetization is a great, great shock to study modes of payment, because they're suddenly at an adoption of cashless pay, economy. <coughs> Uh, but uh, modes of payment can significantly change things because there's a technology in place. It's kind of Uberizing, um, you know, the, the the financial transaction industry. What it's going to do is that you start to naturally get records of every transaction you make, and that is kind of having a fundamental change. So, like for example, when I went to UK in 2012, and when I returned back, I personally felt that there was a huge change in the way people used to do business. Uh, now, it's not a, easy for me to characterize that. But I think that it's important to remember that while we think of India as like something for 2,000 years, India at this moment is on a hockey stick of growth. That's what the word is called. And I'm, I'll show the gra growth graph next, 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 this Friday. So this, it's on a hockey stick of growth. And the changes that is going to happen in the next 10 years, the next 20 years, are just so, hopefully, are going to be so fundamentally different that it's hard to predict what it's going to be like. So we are in a very weird moment in Indian history where essentially we are in the moment when of the Industrial Revolution or something, where what we know in the past and what we are going to know in the future, they may resemble a lot, but at the same time may they also change. So the, next, this, the last six years of change, the change after demonetization, these are not just recent changes. These may be fundamental changes in how business gets organized um, over time. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, we have food outside, so. Thank you very much. Thank you for this we have some uh, slides. Yeah. 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 Thank you. There is lunch outside. Please uh, have lunch and then we'll talk for this. Thank you very much. The next is on Friday, right? The Friday is yeah, Friday. Same. Same time. Same time.